It is almost a law of history that the same wealth that generates a civilization announces its decay. For wealth produces ease as well as art. It softens a people to the ways of luxury and peace and invites invasion from stronger arms and hungrier mouths. On the eastern boundary of the new state, a hardy tribe of mountaineers, the Kassites, looked with envy upon the riches of Babylon. Eight years after Hammurabi's death, they inundated the land, plundered it, retreated, raided it again and again and finally settled down in it as conquerors and rulers. This is the normal origin of aristocracies. They were of non-Semitic stock, perhaps descending of European immigrants from Neolithic days. Their victory over Semitic Babylon represented one more swing of the racial pendulum in Western Asia. For several centuries, Babylonia lived in an ethnic and political chaos that put a stop to the development of science and art. We have a kaleidoscope of this stifling disorder in the Amarna letters, in which the kinglets of Babylonia and Syria, having sent modest tribute to Imperial Egypt after the victories of Thutmose III, beg for aid against rebels and invaders in quarrel about the value of the gifts that they exchange with the disdainful Amenhotep III and the observed and negligent Ignaton. The Amarna letters are dreary reading, full of adulation, argument, entreaty, and complaint. Here, for instance, Bura Buryash II, King of Karduniash, in Mesopotamia, writing to Amenhotep III about the exchange of royal gifts in which Bura Burayash seems to have been worsted. Ever since my father and my mother sustained friendly relationships with your father and mother, they exchanged valuable presents, and the choicest desire each of the other they did not refuse. Now my brother Amenhotep has sent me as a present only two manes of gold. But send me as much gold as thy father, and if it be less, let it be half of what thy father would send. Why didst thou send me only two manes of gold? The Kassites were expelled after almost six centuries of rule as disruptive as the similar sway of the Hyksos in Egypt. The disorder continued for 400 years under more obscure Babylonian rulers whose polysyllabic roster might serve as an obligato to Gray's elegy until the rising power of Assyria in the north stretched down its hand and brought Babylonia under the kings of Nineveh. When Babylon rebelled, Sennacherib destroyed it almost completely. But the genial despotism of Ezaradon restored it to culture and prosperity. The rise of the Medes weakened Assyria, and with their help, Nabopolassar liberated Babylonia, set up an independent dynasty, and dying, bequeathed this second Babylonian kingdom to his son, Nebuchadrezzar II, villain of the vengeful and legendary Book of Daniel. Nebuchadrezzar's inaugural address to Marduk, god-in-chief of Babylon, reveals a glimpse of an oriental monarch's aims and character. As my precious life, do I love thy sublime appearance. Outside of my city Babylon, I have not selected among all sediments any dwelling. At thy command, O merciful martyr, 
May the house that I have built endure forever. May I be satiated with its splendor, attain old age therein with abundant offspring, and receive therein tribute of the kings of all regions from all mankind. He lived almost up to his hopes, for though illiterate and not unquestionably sane, he became the most powerful ruler of his time in the Near East, and the greatest warrior, statesman, and builder in all the succession of Babylonian kings after Hammurabi himself. When Egypt conspired with Assyria to reduce Babylonia to vassalage again, Nebuchadrezzar met the Egyptian hosts at Carchemish on the upper reaches of the Euphrates and almost annihilated them. Palestine and Syria then fell easily under his sway, and Babylonian merchants controlled all the trade that flowed across Western Asia from the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean Sea. And Nebuchadrezzar spent the tolls of this trade, the tributes of these subjects, and the taxes of his people, in beautifying his capital and assuaging the hunger of the priests. Is not this the great Babylon that I built? He resisted the temptation to be merely a conqueror. He sallied forth occasionally to teach his subjects the virtues of submission, but for the most part he stayed at home, making Babylon the unrivaled capital of the Near East, the largest and most magnificent metropolis of the ancient world. Nabo Palasar had laid plans for the reconstruction of the city. Nebuchadrezzar used his long reign of 43 years to carry them to completion. Herodotus, who saw Babylon a century and a half later, described it as standing in a spacious plain and surrounded by a wall 56 miles in length so broad that a four-horse chariot could be driven along the top and enclosing an area of some 200 square miles. Probably this included not only the city proper, but a large agricultural hinterland within the walls, designed to provide the teeming metropolis with sustenance in time of siege. Through the center of the town, ran the palm-fringed Euphrates, busy with commerce, and spanned by a handsome bridge. If we may trust Diodorus Siculus, a tunnel 15 feet wide and 12 feet high connected the two banks. Practically all the better buildings were of brick, for stone was rare in Mesopotamia. But the bricks were often faced with enameled tiles of brilliant blue yellow or white, adorned with animal and other figures in glazed relief, which remain to this day supreme in their kind. Nearly all the bricks so far recovered from the site of Babylon bear the proud inscription, I am Nebuchadrezzar, King of Babylon. Approaching the city, the traveler saw first at the crown of a very mountain of masonry, an immense and lofty ziggurat, rising in seven stages of gleaming enamel to a height of 650 feet. Crowned with a shrine containing a massive tab table of solid gold, and an ornate bed on which, each night, some woman slept to await the pleasure of the god. This structure, taller than the pyramids of Egypt, and surpassing in height all but the latest of modern buildings, was probably the Tower of Babel of Hebraic myth, the many-storied audacity of a people who did not yo know Yahweh, and whom the God of hosts was supposed to have confounded with a multiplicity of tongues. Babel, however, does not mean confusion or Babel, as the legend supposes. As used in the word Babylon, it meant the gate of God. 
South of the ziggurat stood the gigantic Temple of Marduk, tutelary deity of Babylon. Around, around and below this temple, the city spread itself out in a few wide and brilliant avenues, crossed by crowded canals and narrow winding streets, alive, no doubt, with traffic and bazaars, and orientally odorous with garbage and humanity. Connecting the temples was a spacious, sacred way, paved with asphalt-covered bricks, overlaid with flags of limestone and red breccia. Over this, the gods might pass without muddying their feet. This broad avenue was flanked with walls of colored tile, on which stood out in low relief 120 brightly enameled lions, snarling to keep the impious away. At one end of the sacred way rose the magnificent Ishtar Gate, a massive double portal of resplendent tiles adorned with enameled flowers and animals of admirable color, vitality, and line. Six hundred yards north of the Tower of Babel rose a mound called Kasser, on which Nebuchadrezzar built the most imposing of his palaces. At its center stood his principal dwelling place, the walls of finely made yellow brick, the floors of white and mottled sandstone. Reliefs of vivid blue glaze adorned the surfaces, and gigantic basalt lions guarded the entrance. Nearby, supported on a succession of superimposed circular colonnades, if we are to believe the legend, were the famous Hanging Gardens, which the Greeks included among the Seven Wonders of the World. The gallant Nebuchadrezzar had built them for one of his wives, the daughter of Cyaxares, king of the Medes. This princess, the story goes, unaccustomed to the hot sun and dust of Babylon, pined for the verdure of her native hills. The topmost terrace was covered with rich soil to the depth of many feet, providing space and nourishment not merely for varied flowers and plants, but for the largest and most deep-rooted trees. Hydraulic engines concealed in the columns and manned by shifts of slaves carried water from the Euphrates to the highest tier of the gardens. Here, 75 feet above the ground, in the cool shade of tall trees, and surrounded by exotic shrubs and fragrant flowers, the ladies of the royal harem walked unveiled, secure from the common eye, while in the plains and streets below, the common man and woman plowed, wove, built, carried burdens, and reproduced their kind. <laughs>